Well, I was always, always, always very controlling. LAPD, I'm Brady 348. Yes, hi. Um, I live in Benedict Canyon, and um, my next-door neighbor, one of our other neighbors, um, found her dog on the street yesterday. Uh -huh. and, um, on the end. and I remember uh, Jim saying to me at some point that, um, you know, you would burp in public. Oh, think yes, about it. yes, yes. Tell me about that. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most credible voice in true crime. On Wednesday, March the 4th, the much-anticipated Robert Durst trial finally got underway in LA. Talk about a cold case, 20 years after the 2000 murder of his best friend Susan Berman, the case is finally being heard. Susan Berman was found sprawled on the floor, shot dead, a gunshot wound to the back of her head. The Los Angeles Times described the 911 call happening shortly after noon on Christmas Eve in 2000 when a dispatcher in Los Angeles received the call. And it was from a neighbor who was worried about dogs barking outside the home along the busy Benedict Canyon Drive. The tenant's Isuzu, the tenant being Susan Berman, was parked in the driveway, but the caller said the back door was wide open and the woman who lived there was not answering her phone. When you listen to the 911 call, and I'll play the call in full at the end of this episode, it does sound very innocuous. There's kind of a little bit of chuckling, sort of light, a little bit of light-hearted banter between the caller and the operator. And there's the sense that, you know, it's really just a wellness check. It's probably not going to be anything. And of course, just like the Chris Watts case, it turned out to be a pretty serious crime had been committed. In this episode, we're going to go through the prosecution's opening arguments and what is very brilliantly done. In fact, this particular opening statement is something that students of law would do well to study just because it's done so well. It is important to tell a story. It is important to weave the evidence together in a compelling, true and believable story. And you can't do better than to use the defendant's own words against him. And that is exactly what they've done here. Obviously, the prosecutor, the deputy district attorney, John Lewin, has been able to get his hands on quite a lot of video and audio and um, a lot of that from the jinx, a lot of that is used in his opening statement, although not just that, he uses other sources as well. But the theme that, uh, uh, that comes across in all of these little snippets is that Durst is pretty clear that the rules don't apply to him. The rules don't apply to him in the smallest areas and they don't apply to him in obviously the most important areas and across the board. And that is why I'm working on a book called Entitlement. That's the title of the book on Durst. That seems to me sums up Durst in a single word, a very entitled, a grossly greedy, entitled man, where life and work and honesty and just doing what everyone else is supposed to do to get by just didn't apply to him because he didn't feel like it. Interestingly, in court, although Durst looks frail, you should never underestimate him. He's won a court battle before, and he signaled his defiance in court, according to the Los Angeles Times, fist bumping his attorneys and even once raising both his arms victoriously as he looked out to the court audience. Some new information that has come through in this sort of opening statement is the point made by Lewin that Kathy Durst, this is uh, Robert Durst's first wife, where she was likely buried. Her body has never been found. 
but he's basically been saying that um, she was very likely buried at the Pine Barrens area, which is an, a notorious mafia burial ground and an area where you wouldn't need to dig or you wouldn't need to have a lot of effort to dispose of someone even in the middle of winter because the soil doesn't freeze because it's, it's so sandy there. And that's certainly new information we haven't heard before. In summary, the opening statement was constantly interrupted and objected to by Dick de Gurian, Durst Defence Council, and eventually this really annoyed uh, Lewin, who eventually said to him, you present what you want to present and I'll present what I want to present. And he basically shouted this at Dick de Gurian. In this episode, I'm just going to highlight some of the most important slides showed during the opening presentation and just a couple of the voice clips and video clips that were shown during this opening presentation. If you're not familiar with me, I am a South African-based investigative photojournalist and best-selling author. I've written about many high-profile crimes, including John Benet Ramsey, Madeleine McCann, O.J. Simpson, Chris Watts, Casey Anthony, Amanda Knox, and The West Memphis Three. And I will be writing a book on this case as well. If you're interested in my analysis, please subscribe to the channel, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. I would work in public. I got used to it in college. Um, and I just kept burping in public, and when it, I mean, I'm amazed that, that, that my father never said, Bob, but he couldn't say to me, you can't come in if you're going to keep coming into the, it's terrible, it's embarrassing, and burping loudly, belching, he said, you don't burp, you belch, or maybe that was my sister who first came up with that, he belches. Uh, and I kind of liked it in, in, in the business because it made it very clear to everybody that I wasn't going to follow the simplest of the rules. For, for, for forget about taking the thing seriously. And was it, um, I mean, did you enjoy the idea that you'd be in a meeting and would discuss Yes, I did enjoy it. Tell me in a, in a full sentence. Well, I would be in a meeting and I would try, be trying to impress upon everybody and I thought it was a complete waste of time and silly, and I would let out a big belch. No apology, no I'm sorry, no nothing. Just, you know, keep going. But you knew you were doing it. Yeah, sure. But I can do what I want. There's nothing anybody can do about it. Tough. You said Susan was your best friend, right? I mean, yeah. No? Yes. Oh, oh no, I'm not Susan sorry. Was, was probably closer to me. For two years of my life, Kathy was my best friend. Right. But other than that, Susan was my best friend. And, and Susan was a very loyal person, would you agree? Absolutely. So we get quite an intimate sketch of Robert Durst, sort of right off the bat. We get a guy who is quite rude someone who's very, very rough around the edges, but someone who's also very clearly very strong-willed and used to getting his own way. He's basically a, a spoiled brat, except that he was a spoiled brat his entire life. And the question is, what happens if you're a very spoiled brat and a very controlling person and you have, let's say, a lot of power and resources? What might you do with that? Would you do a little with it or a lot? And I think the answer to the, that question is, well, exactly how controlling are we talking about? Exactly how greedy are we talking about? Exactly how entitled are we talking about? Exactly how large is this chip on Bob Durst's shoulder? Is it large enough to commit one murder? Well, how about two or three? And that raises the question, who are we talking about? And this is um, something that was very skillfully done by the prosecutor. He combined not only the initial circumstances of the case, which we'll go through in a second, but also the characters of the people we're talking about. And that's an essential part of true crime. 
you need to know who you are dealing with in terms of Durst, also um, Susan Berman and Kathy Durst as well. And the prosecutor introduces all three of these people and to some extent with objections from the defense objecting to the character evidence. You are allowed to provide character evidence in a situation where there might be domestic abuse, which is being alleged in this case. Yes, nine years as an old term. I had rules of education. She had zilch. Um, girl from a small town with, with, without, you know, no, no big deal. I mean, for me, I, I, I guess you would say I was marrying beneath me or something like that. Or she was marrying up or well or something like that. But I never got there. I mean, money didn't mean anything to me and didn't make any difference to me where she was from. Well, I was always, always, always very controlling. So the prosecutor is spot on just saying that it is amazing that Durst actually admits to certain things. He admits to his utter contempt for people that loved him and were very close to him, including Kathy. And um, it also sort of expresses itself through the way that he would have um, girlfriends and so on. And he would pretend not to be in a relationship with his wife whereas Kathy wasn't allowed to have an affair with anyone. And when she fell pregnant, he said, well, you're either going to get a, uh, an abortion or we're going to get divorced. And think about the dynamic that is involved where you've got a very controlling person and then a situation like a, um, a pregnancy, which starts to kind of wedge its way through that, that sense of control, that veneer of control. And obviously, Durst didn't like this, and but it was really from the moment of the abortion onwards that the relationship between Durst and Kathy began to unravel. And so you can clearly see what the prosecution is angling at. They're sort of angling at a guy who lives by his own rules, but he expects other people to live by his rules and not do as he does. He, he can do as he pleases, but no one else can do as they please. And then you have a situation, for example, like a pregnancy, which results from you know what, and then he wants to exert control basically over every aspect of a person's life. In, in terms of true crime, what are we talking about when we talk about someone who tries eventually to exert control over every aspect of someone else's life? It's pretty clear, isn't it? And jealous if you knew that she was having an affair? I'm sure I would have. So was it you were proudly the bearer of the double standard that we all... Absolutely. Could she <laughs> bother me at all? I honestly you know, I never voiced it like that or thought it through like that. But the way I felt was I feel like having sex with somebody else it's all right. But boy, you better not. I think that she, uh, at one point... Um, uh, the, uh, I, I heard something about that Kat, that you would ask Kathy to go to the social services office and pick up more food stamps and she was very upset about that because she thought that that was not right or yeah 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 I remember the food stamps thing she thought we shouldn't be doing it and tell me what, what do you remember about that or she not? didn't think we should be using food stamps when there's so little money available for the low-income programs, you obviously, we don't need food stamps, why are you doing it? And I think she felt embarrassed, the supermarket, with our food stamps. Now, in 76, Kathy discovered that she was pregnant. Um, this was Mr. Durr's reaction to her pregnancy. And again, these are his words, not mine. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Given uh, our discussion uh, in the absence of the jury, this is character. This is this is uh, an attempt to make him look bad. Her, her letting you know that she was pregnant. How, how did you find out? She called me. She she thrown up a couple of mornings 
and she said she was going to see the doctor, and she called me uh, during the day and said, I'm pregnant, and I want to keep this baby. And I, I said, I'm coming home. And I left the office and went back there, and we had a confrontation. I said, I told you from the beginning I didn't want children. No secrets. You agreed that we wouldn't have children. Um, now you're telling me you want to, you're you're pregnant, which you know you're in charge of that stuff, not me. Um, and you want to keep the baby. Well, you keep the baby, you're going to get divorced from me. Period. So for me, it was fascinating how much the prosecution's opening arguments felt like a documentary. There's plenty of audiovisual material on screen. I haven't really played all of it, just some of the highlights, but complementing and supplementing the opening statement. A fair amount of audio was also presented, not just from the jinx, but also from various uh, interviews. Uh, the defense, as I mentioned earlier, tried to interrupt on numerous occasions and was roundly chastised by the judge. When opening statements are made, typically in court, both sides basically present their opposing arguments. It's really bad form for either counsel to object during this phase, and the Durst defense did so numerous times. This was done not so much for an actual legal result. In other words, there wasn't really a legitimate reason for them doing it, or they weren't really trying to get a particular outcome. All they were really trying to do was disrupt the flow, break the flow, interrupt the momentum and the concentration of the prosecution's case. They were trying to sort of break the link or the connection that was being formed between the prosecution and the jury. Personally, with the technology currently available, I don't know why most court cases don't make more use of images, video and audio to present a case. I've said in a lot of courtrooms and heard long dry arguments and maybe the information is accurate, maybe it's factual, maybe it's on point, but it ends up being very dull. You're talking about people, human beings that are used to being being informed on uh, an array of devices from online to television to movies to radio and so on. And then when you're in the courtroom, suddenly it's this very dry, boring, slow, long unfolding of a narrative. And it doesn't need to be that way. I'm not saying you need a soundtrack and you need a song and dance. I'm just saying there is a way to make information come to life without dressing it up. And one of the obvious ways is using photography, using video evidence. And increasingly, it's, this is happening anyway, CCTV and those sort of artifacts. I'm just saying it probably needs to occur more often. Obviously, not all suspects have given television interviews or have the kind of celebrity aspect as Durst. But nevertheless, one can make some of these arguments by putting together a slideshow and putting together information that can be projected in a way that is visually arresting. A picture, as they say, is like a thousand words. A video is often like a million words. The prosecution showing Susan Berman lying on the floor dead with the rest of the house undisturbed and no breaking and entering basically makes their case. The cadaver note and Durst's entitled oddball behavior does pretty much the rest. Durst himself appears black-eyed and reptilian as usual, but there's evidently still fight in the frail old dog. Thus far, the prosecution haven't completed their opening arguments. These will continue today on the 5th of March. I'll be covering that as well. And then obviously the defense will try to provide their arguments and their opening in a way that will be persuasive from their perspective. I have an idea the defense um, opening will be a lot shorter than the prosecution's. In terms of some of the things raised during the prosecution's case, I agree that Susan Berman probably did know her attacker. It 
can be inferred that she turned her back on on her killer. She, she appeared to be walking bare feet. There's no blood under her feet by the looks of those photos. And um, it does look like she was shot in the back of the head as she was walking into a sort of a back room, you know, having just let someone into her home. I do think it's a bit speculative to say that she wouldn't open the door to a stranger. I mean, what, who qualifies as a stranger? Someone who's completely unknown or someone who's relatively unknown? I think one of the strongest cases the prosecution have is in this dichotomy or the, the sort of um, contradiction in someone entering the home, committing a violent crime, and then nothing else is disturbed. Her valuables are there, her credit cards are there, her car is still in the driveway. The entire house is sort of locked up, but the back door is wide open, and the dogs are running around, and this is essentially what alerted everyone to what was going on. I don't want to state the obvious, but I guess it probably is necessary to reiterate that what makes this Durst case weird is you've got someone who was set up to live the life of his dreams. He could have lived any way that he wanted to. You had a guy who was born into privilege, a guy who was part of one of the most uh, wealthy families in New York, if not America, you know, the son of billionaires, right? And somehow he appeared to go on kind of a dark journey. Regardless of whether you think Durst is innocent or guilty, the journey that he went on, you know, falling out of favor with his own family, living kind of as a re recluse in Galveston, Texas in 2001, is all a very dark chapter in his life. And the one, two or three murders that he's being associated with, rightly or wrongly, make that darkness even darker. And it just makes one wonder, how does a person become what they are? How does a person that has all the fortune and favor bestowed on them end up going along a particular path? And I think one of the ways to answer that is this concept of entitlement, which is very much a sign of modern times, wouldn't you say? And that is why I think the character aspect of these people, Durst and those surrounding him, is pretty fascinating. I'm not going to take this further. If you're interested in further analysis of this trial, please subscribe to the channel. On Patreon, I've just uploaded the penultimate episode in the Atkinson transcripts. Once that series is complete, I will be starting up the Kessinger tapes. And also look out for Blood and Seawater, the audiobook on the Scott Peterson case on Patreon on the $10 tier. And I'll be doing a, a live broadcast on Sunday at 10, 10 a.m. EST. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. Yes, hi. Um, I live in Benedict Canyon, and um, my next door neighbor, one of our other neighbors, um, found her dog on the street yesterday. Uh -huh. And um, was it dead? Or no? Oh, no, 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 no. We have her. Uh, the problem is, um, they gave us the dog, and we went over next door to see if Susan was home, and her car's in the driveway. She's not answering her door. They're packing our doorstep. She's not answering her phone. Her back door is wide open. So, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> so, the door is open, Dory. I'll say not going tight. Oh, no, we're not. Okay. No, we're not. We have, um, her other dogs are in her yard, and they're barking their little heads off, and um, she would not, I mean, our area, there are a lot of animals. Nobody leaves their dog out overnight, so it's very weird. Okay, what's her address? Um, actually, it's a good question. I can give you mine. She's next door. Okay. I'm going to turn her number. Yeah, what's your address? 1531 uh -huh. Benedict Canyon Drive. Um, she, looks, she looks by herself, and I hate to think. Yeah. Is she elderly or? Not particularly, but you never know. I mean, teenagers get bed in the shower and get knocked out. Yeah. And what was your name? Uh, my name is Catherine Cutter, C-U-T-T-E-R. Okay. Oh, 
Okay, let's go ahead and get some of the 